Thank you very much for registering for this seminar on how the legislature will be conducted this session and some of the policy matters and legislation that will be discussed. Before I introduce the speakers for the seminar, let me mention some preliminary matters. I'm Bob Toyofuku of the Pacific Law Institute, and I'll be the moderator for this morning. Uh, what we plan to cover is, you know, will the Capitol be completely open? Will it be similar to pre-COVID times? Uh, and uh, will the hearings and testimony be similar to what how they uh, handled it in 2022? In other words, hybrid, both in-person and virtual. Uh, what about making appointments with legislators? And uh, uh, it's just things similar to that to that that all of you are interested in. Uh, if you have any questions, please write them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and not the chat, and we will answer as many as possible as time permits. If you anyone needs to utilize captions, press the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and then press request. Uh, lastly, uh, please take a moment at the end of the seminar this morning to fill out the evaluations, uh, which will help us as we move forward with these different forums. Uh, some basic information, <clears throat> the legislative website was updated and you can see it at, many of you know, it's capital.hawaii.gov. Uh, there's a lot of general inf information and uh, frequently asked questions. The public access uh, room created a guide and uh, to, the, to the site. So click on that and you can get more information. Uh, I'd like to now uh, take a moment to introduce the speakers for the seminar. First of all, we have Senator President Ronald Kouchi. And I want to mention that he uh, has taken the time, he's at a conference on the mainland, but he's uh, uh, taking some time to uh, make some comments. We also have Speaker of the House, Scott Psyche, Senator Carl Rhodes, who is Chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Representative Della Albalati, who is Chair of the House Health and Homeless, Homelessness Committee, uh, Senator Gilbert Keith Agaron, who is Vice Chair of the Senate Ways and Means Committee, Representative Lisa Kitagawa, Vice Chair of the High House Finance Committee, and Robert Harris, who is a, a executive director of, of the State Ethics Commission. You know, I very much appreciate the time they have set aside to inform all of you how the 2023 session will be conducted and some of the issues that will definitely be before the legislature. So let me now turn it over to Senate President and House Speaker to make some comments. As I mentioned, Senate President is at a conference on the mainland, and so we are going to hear him on audio, and his uh, handsome photo is on the screen. Here you go, Ron. Off to you, Ron. Well, aloha, and thank you, Bob, for using such a wonderfully doctored photograph of myself. Uh, I appreciate what you and Think Tank Tech are doing for the third year in trying to keep uh, the people who are transacting uh, business at the Capitol informed about the process and procedures and uh, the upcoming bills. The Capitol will be open uh, for each individual member of the Senate and I'll speak for the Senate operation only, uh, they all have their own unique uh, place in life, whether, uh, you know, their age or if they do have any underlying health conditions. So as far as making an appointment, I would call, send an email. You might have a little different response from each individual member about how they feel that they can meet with you safely but people will be able to come into the Capitol, walk around, uh, you know, attend the hearings and uh, hang out on the railing and see the comings and goings of uh, the daily activity. 
Uh, for opening day, we're going to have 60% capacity on the floor. And while we want to be open, we want to be open in a safe and responsible way. And so we're going to take some steps towards resuming uh, to 100% normalcy, but the uh, COVID uh, you know, spread still tells us that we need to be careful and we need to use some caution in, uh, in how we reopen. Uh, so that's going to be the policy in the Senate. Uh, clearly at the top of the list is still affordable housing, uh, how the $600 million for uh, those on the wait list in Hawaiian homelands, uh, that's going to get deployed dealing with homelessness, uh, you know, it's all in a package after transition housing, you need somewhere permanent to go. And we need to have places that are affordable. We continue to work towards uh, the learning loss and what are we going to do in K through 12, as well as looking at uh, pre-K. But I don't want to get too far into the weeds. That's uh, why I have Senators Keith Agaran and Rhodes representing the Senate, but uh, certainly, certainly from a 30,000 foot level, that's there. And I'd simply close with, there's a lot of discussion about the surplus money we have. And we've gotten a lot of requests or uh, suggested ideas of how we can spend the money. But I just want to caution everyone that that is a lot of money from a one-time windfall from the federal funds we receive. And they will not be a recurring uh, stream of revenue to sustain recurring costs. And so we need to show some prudence in how we spend the money. And a lot of it should go into uh, one-time non-recurring investments so that we are sure that we can sustain the government that we have. And we have uh, projects like the stadium, uh, a new prison facility, uh, you know, certainly in the affordable housing uh, repair and uh, new construction for schools. And so there'll be a lot of those areas. So I appreciate it. And I'd say thank you very much. And uh, I'm gonna sign off now, thank you. Thank you very much, Senator President and enjoy the conference that you're at on the mainland. I'd like to now ask House Speaker Scott Psyche to make a few comments. Scott. Hey, th Bob, thank you very much for inviting me this morning. Thank you to the Pacific Law Institute and Think Tech for sponsoring this event. I, I'm just, I'm really happy that you're once again um, doing this because this, this forum is so important for people who want to participate um, at the in the legislative process. Um, so as you know, I wanted to do a shout out to the Senate. Um, as the Senate president mentioned, the Capitol will be re will be open, um, and I want to thank the Senate for just working so closely with the House to ensure that all of our proceedings will be accessible, uh, that people can enter the building, um, and we even you know worked with the governor's office to reopen the public parking in the basement. So there's the basement public parking will be open, although the stop you know the number of stalls are is limited. Um, but uh, I think that's a good start for us uh, in this in this new year. Um, the House, you know, will continue to hold committee hearings through a hybrid system, so people testifiers have the option of of participating either in person or uh, through um, through the uh, um, uh, through the YouTube system. Um, so we, you know. Again, I want to thank the Senate for continuing that that um, that practice. I, I think it's something that is here to stay. Uh, the legislature really wants to give people an opportunity to participate, even if it's not in person. Um, I wanted to also mention that the legislature did redesign um, our website. It's capital.hawaii.gov. If you haven't seen it yet, you should take a look at it. It's pretty, it's pretty sleek and streamlined. I think it's it is much improved. Also take a look at that. Um, the other thing is general, the uh, there is a deadline for grant and aid applications this year. We've decided to once again offer GIA uh, support to nonprofits. The deadline for submission is January 20, and the details for those applications are found on our, our website. And you know, as the um, you know, as the Se Senate president mentioned, um, there are some you know top some issues that are percolating to the surface this year. Um, I wanted to also, you know, clarify that there, you know, the, the Senate President and I spoke on Spotlight a couple of weeks ago, 
and we, uh, we were asked about some of these hot hot topics and but but then our comments were characterized as being um you know in opposition to governor green's initiatives and that's really not accurate because i think what the senate president and i tried to explain was that you know we're going to take up the governor's initiatives and we're going to work with him to see what we could um approve at the, at the end of session so i think we're totally in sync with with the governor and we want to work very closely with him. We have a very close working relationship. But you know, on the House side, uh, similar to the Senate, we will we'll be taking up uh, economic or financial relief. Um, Vice Chair Lisa Kitagawa here is on is on the on this uh, panel, and she'll I'm sure she'll have more detail um, on our initiatives there. Uh, we also have uh, affordable housing initiatives that are, that'll be led by our house our new housing chair. Representative Troy Hashimoto, uh, homeless initiatives by our new chair, Representative Della Albalati, and uh, energy is issues uh, led by our energy and environmental protection chair, Representative Nicole Lowen. And you know, before I um, get off, I just wanted to also mention that um, the House will have 18 new members. We have 18 freshman members. Um, and we also have a bunch of new committee chairs and new leadership, House leadership members. So I think it's gonna be a, uh, an exciting year for all of us. Um, I, I know that all of these members are very excited to be here and to start off this year. And uh, we look forward to working with, with all of you um, throughout 2023. So thanks again, Bob, for having us. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um... We'd like to now uh, turn the program over to Senator Rhodes and Representative Bellotti, uh, who will take some time to review some of the basic procedures uh, that will be followed in the 2023 session. Uh, just to let you know, both uh, Representative Bellotti and uh, uh, Senator Gil Agaron uh, were, uh, did participate in the past couple of years when we had this forum. So I'll turn it over first to Rep Bellotti who will give you kind of a quick overview of issues that many of you probably are interested in. Rep Bellotti? Uh, Bob, just to clarify, do you wanna go over issues in the health committee or just a uh, overview of the basic procedure? No, uh, first, uh, first to go over uh, issues on the, uh, uh, how, how the session's gonna run. And I think many people, many people uh, have uh, been on the on the program last year, so they're somewhat familiar with how the 2022 session ran. But I think it's a, a good review, and there are probably some new people on the panel. Uh, I mean, in the audience as well. So I do want to reiterate what Senate President and Speaker said. The Capitol is open. So Ekomomai, we want to welcome the public back. Uh, we are still do preserving um, virtual testimony, which I think is one of the uh, silver linings of the pandemic. Um, you know, it really fast forwarded us into the 21st century to be able to do remote virtual testimony. So for those audience members who were concerned that we would lose that, we are not losing that. Um, I will say the one thing about being open, uh, one of the things that we are going to do require for people coming into the Capitol is there will be um, checkpoint entrances, much like um, uh, many of our, our government buildings now. If you go into the court system, there's a, you know, a single entry point. If you go into Honolulu Hale, there's a place where you need uh, uh, or, or some of the city buildings, there's a place where you need to go to check in. So for the Capitol, it's going to be at the Diamond Head Mackay uh, elevators on the ground level uh, where you will have to present a photo ID to be able to come in. And then on the bottom level, the parking level below the Capitol, it is a rotunda area and a similar situation. Again, it's very simple, very easy. You just need to pre present a photo ID and then you'll be welcome and, and into the Capitol. Um, in terms of the schedule and the timeline, Bob, we really are returning back to pre-COVID times. And so the legislative timetable is posted on um, the Capitol website. I really urge all of your participants to go to the new Capitol website. There is also a video that you can watch to see how you can navigate the, um, the website as well as register uh, and be uh, have an account 
so that you can submit written testimony. So really, really important. Uh, there's a question in the Q&A. It's capital, C-A-P-I-T-O-L dot Hawaii dot gov, which is where you need to go to see the new and fantastic website. Uh, I'll, I'll start with one thing really important for deadlines. Uh, Speaker Psyche mentioned the deadline for uh, GIA applications. Another big critical deadline is bill introduction deadline, which is uh, Wednesday, uh, January 25th. And just because it's a little different than the Senate, the House has had by custom and practice since 1998, a program where we do have bill introduction limits. So House members are limited to a bill introduction of 20 bills. Chairs are given an additional allotment of 15 bills to introduce. And then caucuses, again, by custom and practice have also been um, a little bit restricted in the number because we really want them to vet their bills. And so for the House side, by custom and practice, caucuses recognized by the speaker um, are allowed to introduce uh, five bills per caucus as part of their official package. So those are some of the really just upfront uh, deadlines that people should be aware of, Bob. Thanks. You know what Rep. Malani just mentioned, especially for those that uh, want to introduce bills in the legislative session, uh, it's very important. Keep in mind the unlimited deadline for introduction by legislators is on uh, two days after we uh, open on uh, January 18. So on January 20, that's an unlimited type of uh, uh, open uh, a period where legislators can submit as many bill as, bills as possible. Uh, however, with some limitation as to the total number they can uh, submit. And previously, uh, in the next three days, 23, 24, and 25, uh, they can introduce five bills per day. So if you're not ready to have a bill introduced, you need to talk to whoever you would like to introduce the bill for you to save some space to uh, have them agree to introduce your bill. That that becomes, you know, very, very uh, crucial. And the last, the other thing, oh, go ahead, Della. Well, Bob, after the bill introduction process, then we're going to do dive right into hearings. And I'm very, very excited to actually be returning to be a chair. Um, we are, like I said, going to have a hybrid system. So uh, everyone is encouraged to submit their testimony via the website so that you can be a part of the process and so that the members can see your uh, testimony in advance. Uh, those those pieces of testimony, uh, as in the past, will be prepared by our vice chairs. I want to uh, recognize that we're going to have, as Speaker Psyche said, 16 to 18 new members. Two of our new members have not yet been appointed, so we still are in a little bit of flux. And those two members, of course, are going to be replacing uh, our dearly beloved uh, representatives, Ryan Yamane and Jimmy Tokioka. So there really is quite a bit of change in the House with these 16 to 18 new members who are going to be part of the House. There are six new chairs. New chairs who have not chaired before and had other rep responsibilities, but six new chairs. And then, of course, 12 new vice chairs. And so I would also urge people to have a little bit of patience. We're learning. We will get it to speed very quickly. We're already seeing our new members doing very well. But again, mm -hmm. sign up early you know, test your processes, make sure you can submit your testimony. And then when you come in and testify, I really urge people, um, you know, to participate. In fact, that's one of the main messages coming from our chief clerk. Please, please participate. We are open. In that part, in that participation, I will say that, um, for me as a chair, as a preference, um, you know, I'm going to, of course, balance the hybrid environment. But, you know, there is a, a value in being in person. So to your audience members, Bob, I think, you know, if they want to participate in person, please come on down to the Capitol. I will also say that one of the things that I think is really engaging about in-person uh, testimony is the exchange that can happen in the Q&A. And so sometimes you miss that in the uh, in the hybrid setting. Um, and so, again, if it's something really important, you know, you don't have to be here. We can engage virtually. But I would also urge people and we're going to be urging for myself, again, as a preference, as a chair, really going to be urging uh, department heads to be present and in the room and, and, and be there because the questions and answers that have to happen in the conversation that is, is engaged in by the community members is critical in that hearing process. Um, again, there's going to be new chairs. 
um, you know, in terms of like time limits for um, offering up testimony, you know, it really depends on the chair and also the volume that may be present in a particular hearing. So, you know, I would expect that some chairs will be imposing time limits, especially if we have really heavy agendas. That is in part driven by the fact that uh, we have morning committees and afternoon committees, and morning committees really only have this 8.30 to noon block in which we can conduct our business. So the limitations are limitations, not because we don't want people to participate. They're limitations because we don't have enough time in the day. Uh, members have to get, House members have to get to the House floor by 12 noon because that's when our sessions start and we need to be present for that. So again, I urge patience with folks. I urge you to really be in contact uh, with the, the staff of the committees. You can contact the vice chairs committee uh, clerk or the, the chairs committee clerk if there are questions about what are the preferences of the chairs. Um, you can look to the website for the guidance about how you contact those committee clerks. You can look to the website and the hearing notices for guidance on what's uh, gonna be expected if you wanna, if you need additional aid, auxiliary aids for those who might be disabled. And so all of those things are in place to really encourage participation. And I think that's all I'll say for now on those hearings. Um, somebody asked a question, I'll just answer it. Uh, they wanted to know, you're right, Della. There's going to be six. There's 16 new legislators in the House, and there are going to be two more because Rep. Tokioka and Rep. Imani are uh, going. I have resigned already and are going into uh, Governor Green's uh, administration. Uh, the question was, how do they detect who the new legislators are? There is no list on the website that says. Uh, a certain a certain representative or senator is new, just recently elected. Uh, initially, when there was a photo of all the uh, senators and reps, uh, they only had photos of existing uh, legislators, uh, incumbents. Basically, they got reelected. Um, you just have to go through it. Uh, because I've been lobbying for a long time, I, I know all the uh, legislators that uh, were reelected and who the new legislators are. Uh, but do the best you can uh, with that. And uh, there are two brand new legislators in the Senate. Uh, two, one Republican, one Democrat were uh, elected. Uh, but the others, I think you would recognize because there are two council members that were elected to the Senate and two representatives that were elected to the Senate. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll try and handle some of the other questions, but I'd like to now turn it over to Senator Carl Rhodes to add anything on on the general overview of how the session is going to run and anything particular uh, to the Senate. Senator Rhodes. Thanks, Bob. Uh, yeah, no, I think uh, uh, Representative Bellotti has described the overall um, situation very accurately. There are a couple of minor but uh, fairly important differences between procedure in the Senate and the House that can affect people who are testifying. The first is that for when we hear a bill, we have to give 72 hours notice, whereas in the House, they only have to give 48. So we give you a little more time for the hearings. The other important difference is that the House hears every time it's referred to a committee, they hear the bill. Our second committees, we are allowed to hear the, uh, we are allowed to hear the bill, but we almost never do. It's almost always a decision making only. This is driven largely by the fact that we have uh, confirmations to do. Now, I was in the House for 10 years. I don't think I realized how much time and effort was involved with that until I got over to the Senate, now, especially there are certain committees that just get overwhelmed. The uh, Consumer Protection has dozens of, uh, of nominees that they're supposed to confirm or, or not confirm. And health is another one where there's just there's just so many. So that's that's why we take that sort of shortcut on the second committees, uh, just just for time uh, purposes. The other thing that we don't do very often, even though the rules would allow for it, is we don't generally do triple referrals. So in the House, that's that's kind of the reason their deadlines are short is because sometimes their windows, the chair's windows of opportunity to hear a bill are very short. So they that that twenty four hours does sometimes make a difference, especially for that that middle referral of a triple. Um, 
other than that, I think those, those are the those are the those are the areas where there's enough of a difference between House and Senate procedure that it's worth noting. Uh, 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 Rep. Alani and and uh, Senator Rhodes, while while uh, Rep. Alani was going over some things, I was looking at the Q and A, uh, and I can't remember uh, Della if you did talk about that, but you know on the safety protocols. Uh, did you mention that? Are, 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 is the Capitol still going to require uh, an ID or anything to get in, or is it going to be completely open? Uh, yes, a photo ID is going to be need to be shown um, uh, at the security uh, checkpoints. Uh, okay, it's, it's going to be similar to, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Someone asked in the chat if uh, employee IDs would be sufficient. I, I believe they will be state Hawaii of Hawaii IDs will be sufficient. Um, and so just have a photo ID license, you know, that, that should be uh, sufficient. I also noticed, uh, Bob, in the uh, uh, chat, a, a question from Lila about the introductions limits for, for House members. The introduction of 20 per uh, legislator or per House member is as a primary introducer. So members can sign on as secondary introducers for as many bills as possible. It's, it's the introduction uh, as a primary introducer that House of uh, Representatives have limits. Great. The last thing, you know, in terms of you have an ID check, but there's no temperature check or need to show your vaccination uh, card or anything, right? No, those requirements have been dropped. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, I'd like, before we get to some of the policy issues that we're going to discuss over the next uh, one hour, uh, I'd like to congratulate all of the 16 uh, new members that were elected to the House and the two senators that were elected to the Senate. And uh, I think you know that uh, uh, Representative Aquino and Representative McKelvey uh, uh, left the House, ran for the Senate, and got elected. And Councilperson Carol Fukunaga, who used to be a senator, is now back in the Senate. And uh, 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 so we we have that, and uh, Brandon Elefante, who was a council member for uh, two terms, uh, ran for the Senate and and was uh, elected to the Senate. So those are the new members in the Senate. I won't take the time right now to go through all the new members in the House, but uh, congratulations and uh, uh, good luck as you uh, start your first uh, legislative session. And I, I think we have a, a, another new senator, too, uh, Tim Richards, as well. Oh, yeah, the Democratic senator, sorry, and Ava, the new Republican senator. Right, yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, we're going to take the next hour until 1030 to go over some of the issues that will definitely come up. And uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, go to Senator Carl Rhodes, who's chair of the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee. And just to mention, uh, there are two Supreme Court justices uh, that have to retire because they reached age 70 and say so they've already submitted uh, their resignation. And so Governor uh, Josh Green will be appointing two new uh, uh, justices. So that's one issue that's going to come up. And I mentioned to Senator Rhodes uh, to mention any other issues that are going to come up in the Senate Judiciary. You know, there's a lot of media attention to firearms, uh, et cetera. So I'll turn it over to uh, Senator Rhodes to mention some of those uh, policy issues. All right. Thanks, Bob. Uh, yes, as you, as you say, there are going to be two Supreme Court nominations uh, this year. Uh, the process for the thumbnail of the process, for those of you who don't uh, necessarily pay a lot of attention to it, is that you can be nominated to or you can volunteer to be a Supreme Court justice. And you, you at first you go to the Judicial Selection Commission, the Judi Judicial Selection Commission. Uh, that's the, the nominees or the people who have uh, indicated interest in being a Supreme Court justice. And then they submit a list of four to six people to the governor. The governor uh, gets to choose one of them. Of course, well, in this case, they get to choose two, but there'll be two separate lists, one for each of the two that are available. And once they've done their, their vetting and decided which of the four to six that they want, then they send it on to the Senate for confirmation or not. So that's the, that's the basic um, 
that's the basic process until it gets to the Senate. The Senate then has 30 days to either confirm them or to reject them. And the now I'm you know I'm chair of the Judiciary Committee, so I'm, I'm the one who is most heavily involved in that. And usually we schedule the hearings about three weeks after the nomination's been made. What that allows people to do is uh, it allows other senators to meet with them, allows me to meet with them. We do more background checks. Uh, we try to make sure that we're getting people who are ethically, uh, uh, you know, that there, there are no ethical problems. And then we have a hearing. And uh, generally we, well, I've always had time limits on my hearing ever since I was labor chair, starting back in 20, 2009, I guess. I've always had a two-minute time limit. And uh, it's because it's just the volume of testimony sometimes is so great that you have to, you just have to limit it some. Uh, members will often call you back up for questions. So even though if you only have two minutes of uh, straight testimony, you'll often get more than that if somebody on the committee has more questions for you. Once the committee has uh, met, we vote, and if we approve, uh, well, whether we approve or not, the nominee goes to the floor for a full Senate vote. Um, generally, you know, it's, it's unusual that a nominee gets rejected, but it does happen occasionally. And uh, I think that's pretty much the summary on on the um, on the Supreme Court justices. Other issues that I think were are almost inevitably going to come up are. Um, and those of you who are familiar with the Obrero decision from last summer, uh, we did actually reach an agreement on a bill over the summer, but it was and the timing of it was such that we didn't get it, it. By that point, it was too late to really have a special session. So we put it off until until now. Unfortunately, the uh, the grand jurors were able to keep up with the demand from the prosecutors for recharging people that uh, had their charges dropped because of the Obrero decision. So I think that's almost for sure. Uh, I would guess that there'll be uh, something. There, there was a U.S. Supreme Court decision called the Bruin case that changed pretty fundamentally what we're allowed to do at the state level for concealed and open for, for concealed carry weapons. Um, because we've had so few carry uh, uh, publicly carried weapons for the last, I don't know, 40 years, we don't really have any rules about where you can and can't take them. So I think a bill having to do with uh, so-called sensitive places, whether you can take your uh, take your concealed carry into a courtroom or into a school or onto a playground or uh, the, the football stadium, if we when we if and when we build a new one, that sort of thing is is going to come up. Um, the other one, the other topic in this, and uh, Mr. Harris will be covering this in more detail. But there, you know, I think the ethics slash campaign finance reform. Uh, there's going to be issues that come up there that uh, primarily go through judiciary as well. So uh, uh, my new counterpart, uh, Representative Tarnas at the Judiciary and Hawaiian Affairs Committee in the House and I are going to be very busy this year. Uh, th thank you very much, Carl. One of the things that uh, I, I do testify at uh, judicial confirmation uh, uh, hearings, if I know uh, what, whoever attorney is uh, being nominated. And one thing, this is my personal uh, comment. Um, I always look at the qualifications of the person being nominated and I restrict my comments to that person's qualifications. And uh, I just wanted to mention that because sometimes it goes off. Uh, and I, I think that it's important to realize that the qualifications of the nominee, whether it's for the judiciary or a department, is, is the focus of uh, the confirmation hearing. So that's a good point. And I, I think it's worth commenting that, you know, the fact that the Judicial Selection Commission will now be releasing the names of those who did not make the cut to, to, to be given to the governor and the governor and the names given to the governor will be public as well. I think there will be a level of second guessing that uh, we didn't have before. I don't know how constructive that will be. The, people need to keep in mind that as the Judiciary Chair and as the Judiciary Committee and the whole Senate looks at it, we get quite a lot of information about the person who's actually nominated. We get to look at their JSC application and we can dig into them quite, um, quite a bit in quite a bit of detail. We don't have that same information for the people that didn't get to the Senate. So it's 
you know, you, you can always, I feel, you know, people, I, I'm, I'm afraid or maybe not afraid is the right word. I think it's possible that certain groups will fight a particular nominee knowing that the person they really wanted was on the list and we're going to try to kill this nominee and hopefully the governor will appoint our guy next or our woman next time. Um, you know, it's really hard. It's really hard for me to judge which is the better candidate because I don't have the same level of information for both of them. So there does have to be some level of trust between the Senate and the governor as to whether they pick the best one uh, from the pool available. Th thank you very much, Senator. You know, I feel the same way that, you know, if I want, uh, when the nominees are, are announced, if I feel like, uh, uh, one person on the uh, or whoever on the list I feel is the better person and I'd like to weigh in, then my uh, uh, position is to talk to the governor and or send a letter to the governor saying, I think uh, this person on the list would make the best judge uh, or department head or whoever. But thank you. Um, I think let let me check real quickly if there's any uh, Bob, I can take some of these procedural questions that have popped up. I can answer them quickly. Yeah, go ahead. So there was a question. Opening day is Wednesday, January 18th. If you can't be there in person, uh, there will be you can watch it on Alelo and you can likely watch it on our, the YouTube channels uh, for the House and the Senate, respectively. How to communicate your legislative priorities? Uh, yes, if you are with a group, send an email to um, our House leadership or our Senate leadership. But you can also co directly contact um, chairs and committee members. Simply send an email. That's a very good way to communicate your group's legislative priorities. Um, Donald had a question about how do oral testimonies virtually be conducted for blind individuals or really any individuals who do not have access to computers or smartphones? Uh, that is a challenge. I don't know uh, what the specific answer to that is. I do know that um, during the pandemic that public libraries had iPads available and that was part of the project. So Bob, on that question, I can follow up. That, that really is a question about you know, access to computers and, and, and smartphones for anybody. That's a challenge. So that's why we also have the um, option to um, to come down and, and, and do things in person as well. Finally, Susan asked a question about um, uh, limits on the uh, bill introduction for House members. I, I want to clarify again, it's 20 per individual uh, representatives. It's another additional 10 for our morning committee chairs, this, these are the subject matter, subject matter committee chairs, and then an additional 15 for our afternoon committees, which are the finance, CPC, judiciary, higher ed, and education. So those are the limits for the House. I'm sure there's other questions, but we can address those later. You know, one of the questions, uh, is this, is this uh, program being recorded and will be viewed? Yes, it is. Think Tech is recording this, and it will be shown later either on ThinkTech or on YouTube. And uh, in the past, we've talked to Olelo to see whether they wanted to uh, rebroadcast this as well. Um, one other quick, um, oh, somebody had mentioned that a lot of, uh, when they testify virtually, that uh, there's no follow-up questions. Whereas uh, people with titles, so-called titles, get the questions, but uh, I've seen people that uh, have testified virtually um, after all the testimony is over, depending on how the chair runs the committee, be, uh, they were asked a question. So anyway, that that's some of the questions that come up. But Bob, okay. something, Bob, something also to keep in mind, members are often given the opportunity by the chairs to ask questions themselves. So members are looking for people in the audience. Um, I would urge folks, if you're, you know, testifying virtually, if you, you know, think you might be questioned, you need to stay on. So that's another uh, another valuable reason why to be in person uh, is that you you might be called upon to be asked a question. Finally, I did see a question in the uh, chat line about attorney generals. So to our government employees who are on this um, webinar, you know, I understand that you might be pulled in many different directions, and and as you know like during the course of the legislative process, we winnow the bills down. So clearly, um, you know, my preference is to have department heads, the, the leadership in the, in the departments present when we're, uh, you know, 
hearing bills. For the attorney generals, for the deputies, we understand that you're probably going to be pulled in different directions. So be there when you can. Obviously, be there virtually uh, if possible as well. And then as we progress through session, clearly the bills that are going to become really the hot topic bills where you may need to be present, that, that's a judgment call on your part. And I, I would hope, you know, you want to be the best resource to the legislators as possible. So being present is always important. You know, David Rodriguez asked whether on opening day it will be encouraged to uh, meet and greet chairs, leadership, and new members. I assume, you know, legislators, that that will be part of the uh, opening day as usual. Even though in COVID it was shut down. So now that the Capitol is going to be open, I think that people can go in and uh, meet with different uh, chairs and meet as many legislators as they would like with time permitting. Yes, there will, there will be a return to kind of uh, receptions and meet and greet, but I will also caution, you know, we are still in a triple pandemic. We have RSV, flu, uh, uh, COVID still out there. So there is some, some hesitation on some parts. So not all offices may be doing receptions, um, but clearly we're all going to be there and present. And uh, our offices are open, you know, via via email, contact, you know, phone. And, and we're eager to, to get started with the session. Yeah, Bob, I would just add that I think you, I think it's probably a good idea to bring a mask with you because the, the the individual senators and representatives are sort of sovereign in their own offices, and some of them may require, like me, um, a, a mask to come in. But we will be open, and we will have food, uh, unlike the last couple of years. So just be aware. Yeah, that will be great. And, and by the way, I just, uh, to go back to testifying, because I lobby at the legislature, I really miss having to be being able to go up to the session. And so like, even though I can do it virtually and it's easy, you know, I will probably go back to my old style and go up to the uh, session almost daily and testify in person. Uh, uh, this, this Carl again, I think that, I think that's another one where you're just gonna have to, to, to read the chair, the chairs of the committees by ear, because I personally am still um, quite cautious about it. We, we had 1500 new COVID cases last week and four deaths and it's blowing up in China. So I, I personally will not be discouraging people from going online. And I do question people online. I mean, we've been doing it for two years, so it's not yeah. like we, don't, we haven't had to do this. But uh, yeah, it's still there's still some caution there and we don't really know. Unfortunately, like we have, and like the situation has been this entire pandemic, we don't really know what's going to happen next. Oh, good, good. You know, I, I had thought about it too because reading the uh, national newspapers, you know, and looking at COVID that is increasing in different places. I mean, obviously, if it, hopefully not, but if it starts to increase in Hawaii, I am sure there are going to be changes made as to how the the session will operate because it's just too dangerous and the safety is uh, more important. Okay, uh, Rep Bilotti, uh, you have a few minutes to go over what you see will be issues in the health and homelessness committee. Well, this is a perfect segue, Bob. You know, we are going to be still dealing with a lot of post-COVID issues. Um, and so we're going to have to look at how we're recovering. We're looking at workforce shortage. That's going to be a very big issue uh, within the um, health committee. And homelessness, um, many of the projects that we actually initiated prior to the COVID pandemic, the Ohana Zones, we're going to be having to revisit those projects and see what, what worked and what didn't work. How are we going to continue to address the homelessness issue? And as as a piece of that, um, something that has emerged from our House Policy Committee is the real importance of uh, the prioritization of mental health issues. Those were important before the pandemic, but I think they became uh, exacerbated and highlighted. So we're very concerned about mental health issues in the broadest um, uh, uh, forms, uh, things from pre preventing um, you know, the child care, child um, mental illnesses that we're seeing, the mental health struggles that we see that, that they're having coming out of pandemic, but also looking and continuing to dig deep into the mental health issues that are affecting uh, and impacting our criminal justice system. Um, Senator Carl Rhodes and I have, over the pandemic, continued to work on a mental health task force that includes collaboration with the prosecutors, uh, the public defendants, the judiciary. And so we're going to be following up on some of those pilot programs where we were looking 
looking at mental health diversion uh, versus, uh, you know, direct incarceration, because we know that some of these people cycling in and out of homelessness are, in fact, touching the criminal justice system and then not getting the treatment they need and then just returning back to the streets where we see them, um, you know, sadly in their states of homelessness. Um, those are some of the broad issues, Bob, that we're going to be talking about. And of course, I know that people will also have their, um, you know, other other issues that are really important. I know that the folks out there are talking about recreational cannabis. Uh, we're looking at reproductive health care issues um, that span from, you know, uh, reproductive health, uh, abortion care, uh, all of the things that uh, are are part of that panoply of family planning services. So those are just some of the some of the few issues that the um, uh, House Health and Homelessness Committee will be dealing with. Okay, and anything on uh, any? Have you heard any kind of feedback by the administration or anybody as to what they may be doing with regard to homelessness? I think, you know, we, we, we've been hearing what, you know, G Governor Green's um, support of Kahale. And so I, I hope that we're going to have a, a, a strong conversation about that. Uh, what's really also great is that uh, health and homelessness is paired with human services. So really addressing homelessness is about both the health and the human services issues. And so really looking at, you know, the housing first policies that we've been pursuing through the Kauhales, uh, th through through these, these Ohana zones where we've provided wraparound services in coordination with, um, you know, moving people, trying to find them transition housing, trying to find them um, um, temporary housing, and then moving them towards hopefully more permanent housing. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Rep. Bilotti. Um well, let's now turn to uh, Robert Harris, who is vice chair of the Commission to Improve Standards of Conduct. And the resolution was submitted in 2022 uh, by Speaker Psyche, and the commission started its work in 2022. They came out with an interim report. And uh, several bills actually were submitted and several were passed and everything is on the website. And uh, the CISC, which is the acronym, uh, they came out with a final report. Uh, it's almost 400 pages, which includes rec drafts of recommended legislation that they are intending to submit. I thought that it was very important because all of these uh, uh, recommendations, I think, will be submitted as legislation. So I thought it was important for the audience to uh, hear from uh, Robert Harris. Uh, uh, Dan Foley, retired Judge Foley, was supposed to be on the panel. He was on the brochure, but a conflict came up. So I really appreciate Robert Harris who is the executive director of the State Ethics Commission uh, to, to be on the panel. Um, Robert, did you want to mention the other members or did you want me to go through the, the other members on the commission? I'm happy to, and, and thank, you for the, thank you for the warm introduction. Um, we had a really impressive uh, body of folks that were involved on the commission, including, as you mentioned, uh, retired Judge Dan Foley. Uh, we also had um, uh, Kristen Izumi Natal from the Campaign Spending Commission. Um, we had representatives from the League of Women Voters. We had representative from um, Common Cause. We also had a uh, uh, representative, uh, again, apologies, I, I should actually pull up the actual list. Well, Barbara Mamoto, former uh, legislator, was on it, and uh, Flores Nakakuni, who was a retired U.S. attorney for the District of Hawaii, and of course Janet Mason was the League of Women Voters uh, rep. Correct. Thank you. And we also had Nikos Leverance from the Common Cause Hawaii. So it was a really impressive and diverse group of individuals, I think, representing uh, different points of view, and uh, we had some uh, extensive conversations. And uh, I think, you know, there was uh, a lot of um, uh, agreements that, that were reached over the, over the time. And so I think it, it was a really uh, great joint effort. Well, well, why don't you go through, uh, Robert, some of the, the issues uh, that uh, uh, 
the commission discussed and will probably submit legislation. And one is the so-called uh, Citizens Bill of Rights, which includes uh, several interesting and potentially controversial issues that the legislators have to deal with. Sure, thank you. Um, uh, there were a total of 31 proposals, and so trying to go through each proposal is going to be um, you know, really time consuming. Um, it's probably something that's worth doing. And maybe at a later date, we can try to do a focus on some of those different ideas. But I think what we're trying to do here is really trying to identify some of the, the key ones, particularly this audience might be interested in. So the Public Bill of Rights, um, there were a number of people who offered testimony to the Standards Commission um, flagging, I think, concerns anyone who's been involved with the legislature has probably heard before. Um, things like uh, ability to see testimony that's submitted. So, you know, if a bill is being heard and folks are referencing the testimony that others can't see it, don't understand necessarily where the statistics or facts are coming from. Uh, there were issues such as um, notice of a hearing coming up, sort of trying to make sure that there's an appropriate level of notice or enough time so people can get engaged into it. Um, and so the attempt of the Bill of Rights is to actually sort of establish um, uh, standards around this, essentially saying that this is how we should handle this on a going forward basis. So, for example, one of the things it says is it it recommends that uh, all testimony be available uh, 24 hours after it is submitted. So the idea is that it's available for the public to see. There are other proposals specifically to deal with sort of common ways of addressing a bill. So for example, uh, it recommends um, trying to avoid the triple referral that, that, that maybe perhaps unnecessary referrals, trying to make sure that there's more time within sort of the substantive committees to really, really be able to focus on those bills. Uh, in addition, there's a recommendation that we um, start putting in uh, specific amounts uh, for programs rather than leaving those blank and try to avoid the practice of putting in defective dates, you know, again, with the idea that the bill is good, it should be moving forward, you know, as, as in the best form possible, uh, rather than forcing things into a conference committee. Um, so again, it's a pretty sweeping um, proposal with a lot of different ideas on there. And I think we're going to have some pretty healthy discussion around it. Um. Robert, what about uh, some of the specifics uh, when I looked at the, uh, the different issues that were raised in the citizens' uh, so-called Bill of Rights uh, about uh, trying to do away with uh, the usage of defective dates? And uh, for those in the audience, uh, many times a committee chair or the committee will not have an effective date uh, as to when that bill would uh, be effective. And so they defect the date, you know, so the bill will be effective uh, on July 1, 2050, which we all know is not possible. And one of the reasons that I think the, the committee chairs do that, oftentimes when they finish uh, discussing a bill, it is not in perfect shape as to what they want, let's assume in the House. So they want to make sure when it goes, crosses over to the Senate, that there's going to be further discussion. So that's going to be, I think, uh, Robert, a controversial issue. Uh, but what, what was some of the uh, discussion around that particular um, uh, suggestion? <clears throat> sure. Thanks for the question. Um, uh, I Obviously, um, and, and not to rehash the entire circumstance, but I think many of us are aware that the Standards Commission uh, came out of um, several corruption charges, um, including from a former representative and from a former senator. And one of the quotes that came out of, uh, you know, some of the, those corruption charges included a quote specific that it's, quote, easy to kill a bill and sort of the recognition that, you know, perhaps there is um the power of one individual legislature to try to get rid of a bill specific bill and that is one of sort of the concerns around corruption is that that ease of power ease of use i think we're aware in addition that um the legislature operates under sort of a reciprocity 
arrangement. There's definitely some level of, you know, you hear my bill, I'll hear your bill. Um, your bill will get passed if my bill get passed. And that's sort of a normal political uh, pressure point that, that, that happens. I think the intent of trying to avoid defective dates is it really does sort of allow all bills to be uh, delayed until the very end and allows for more sort of that reciprocity and the ability to kill bills to, to remain. The intent of trying to eliminate the defective date is to essentially say, hey, if the bill is good enough to get out and move forward, you should try to put it in the best form possible and, and move it forward in that, that light. Um, it, typically, if, for example, the House approves a bill, sent to the Senate, the Senate likes it, they should be able to adopt it right then and there and not necessarily have to force something to conference committee. I guess finally, too, I think if people are familiar with a conference committee, the intent of it is to hash out differences, you know, is essentially differences between the House and Senate language. Um, maybe not necessarily supposed to be substantive differences, but, you know, essentially here's the final word in your language. Because that is such a fast pace process, it tends to be more out aside of the public view. Um, and I think a lot of the criticism was too many bills do go to conference committee. And that's where a lot of substantive negotiations happen. And I think the intent is to try to pull some of that away from the conference committee and put it more sort of its original intent, which is sort of hammering out the final language versus uh, making that a substantive negotiating area. You know, another issue that came up during the interim last year and the bill passed to prohibit legislators from uh, holding fundraisers during session, whether it's the regular session, special session, et cetera. <clears throat> I understand that the commission now would like to expand that to say that there can't be any, there can't even be any solicitation or acceptance during session. So if unsolicited, Robert, uh, I know a particular legislator personally, and I send a, uh, a donation campaign contribution to that legislator. Do they have to then return it if the bill passes? Yeah, sure. So I, just briefly, I think the intent was the, the perception that during the legislative session in particular, that I'm... Um, uh, there's a perception that perhaps, you know, uh, leverage could be put on a legislator in exchange for campaign donations. So please support my bill and you'll get a campaign donation and sort of the perception of that, even if it doesn't actually happen, there may be an appearance that is sort of what goes on. So I think the intent was to try to create a freeze period during session and essentially allow uh, the normal campaign uh, contribution process to occur before and after, but try to say hey, during session when some of these bills are being decided, let's sort of create a, a holding pattern. The challenge with fundraising is, you know, fundraising is a specific divine regulatory process where essentially you're going to say, hey, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm sort of hosting an event, allowing people to come in and uh, it's publicly noticed, people are aware of it. Um, so even if that's taken off, which it, which has currently happened under law, uh, Legislators can still meet individually one-on-one -on -one and still ask for donations and get donations, and that sort of has less public notice. So I, I think the the additional step of saying we would like to try to create a, a holding pattern or freeze during the legislative session is also on the solicitation and acceptance. And so, yes, Bob, answering your question specifically, the intent, if this bill were to pass, is if someone uh, submitted a donation uh, during the legislative session, the legislator would have to send it back and presumably it'd send a very nice letter saying, thank you very much. And, you know, after this freeze period, I'd love to accept your donation, but, you know, right now I can't take it. And I think that's the intent of it. You know, are, are there any uh, uh, suggestions uh, uh, by the commission on restrictions on the use of campaign funds? I thought I read something in, in the report that would limit uh, what a le legislator can do with the campaign funds other than during the campaign. Sure. So one of the proposals that came out was uh, reducing or eliminating the ability for a legislator to buy tickets to another legislator's uh, fundraising event. So you know, the perception being that certain legislators uh, you know, who maybe have accumulated more campaign funds can kind of use that to um, help support or sort of um, 
uh, show favoritism to certain candidates and sort of, you know, sort of direct money that way. So I think the intent is sort of remove that appearance that, you know, certain incumbents are able to show favor or sort of use that as a means to to get more um, power within the legislative body and sort of try to, you know, say, hey, that's that's an appropriate use of campaign funds. There was also yeah, proposals submitted by some of the members um, that would have more broadly um, restricted the use of campaign funds and said just essentially you can only use it for campaigns. Um, that wasn't as widely supported within the Senate's commission. So I think the specific proposal now is just looking at the purchase of two tickets. You know what? If you could spend a few few minutes that we have for this segment on, I know there were some suggestions uh, pertaining to the Campaign Spending Commission, uh, as well as uh, for lobbying and lobbyists, if you want to expand on that a little, Robert. Sure. Well, let's just stay on the, the Campaign Spending Commission briefly, just we're already kind of warm on that topic. Uh, there is a proposal to expand the publicly financed elections, which is one that we spent a lot of time talking about. Um, and you know, we hear proposals from other states, sort of what other states are doing. And I think really the perception is this is how to um, maybe try to reduce some of the influence of outside forces and sort of uh, maybe try to reduce the impact of Citizen United generally on elections. Um, so the proposal is to expand the amount of money that'd be available to candidates, but also correspondingly would ask the legislature to help fund and, and eventually help create hopefully a permanent funding mechanism for publicly financed elections. Um, I should caution it's, you know, it's partial publicly funded elections. Um, in addition, there's a proposal by the, um, that came out, which is on pay to play, uh, trying to more specifically um, reduce the um, ability of uh, someone who has a contract with the state of Hawaii uh, currently is not allowed to give campaign contributions, but it's the entity. And so the attempt is to try to expand that to also um, officers uh, and directors from that entity to prevent them from also giving campaign contributions. Relatedly, there's also a similar proposal around grants and aid that entities are doing grants and aid also similarly shouldn't necessarily be making campaign contributions. Um, why don't I go ahead and switch gears just briefly? I'm going to get into the lobbying, um, which I think some of the audience might be interested in. Um, currently, our lobbying laws really are just um, notice. And so the idea is we don't really say there's any good lobbying or bad lobbying, but essentially we just want public disclosure. If someone's being paid to lobby, um, that they have a obligation to disclose that they're lobbying. So one of the proposals is to ask them to uh, identify the bill or matter they're lobbying on with more specific um you know, a more specific description. Right now, they just sort of have to say, I lobbied on a, a subject area. So the idea is actually trying to specifically enumerate, hey, I'm lobbying on this bill and this bill and this bill, and trying to make that a little bit more specific for public disclosure purposes. Another idea is to, or another bill proposal, is to require lobbyists to go through training uh, as a condition of their registration every two years. And so that way we can really make sure they stay abreast of what is sometimes can be a fast evolving area and try to make sure we don't have any uh, hiccups later where they didn't know of something and un unintentionally make a mistake. Um, finally, uh, there are restrictions on state employees and legislators on accepting gifts. Um, however, there's no restrictions on lobbyists from giving gifts correspondingly. So the intent is to try to make it equal um, essentially say, you know, not only can state legislators not take it, but also lobbyists can't give it and try to make sure that there's, uh, you know, uh, uniformity there. Um, that's one of the other proposals. It was a lot, Bob. Is there any follow-up questions you have on those? <laughs> no, no. Well, I mean, the only, uh, I, I put my lobbyist hat on now. I mean, if you have one or two clients that you represent at the state legislature, uh, maybe it's doable to... Um, uh, do the reporting like is being suggested. However, if you have 10, 12 clients that you uh, represent, not that everybody has an issue at that time. In, in other words, there's no legislation you have to pass or oppose. But if you do, then it, the reporting becomes uh, a little onerous, you know? And I think that's a problem because uh, for one client, 
uh, I mean, in the past, you know, I, I may have been tracking and testifying on 10 bills and then to report every single uh, a discussion that I've had or whatever, it's, it's really kind of impossible, you know, uh, uh, to do the report that way. But, you know, the, I'm not saying that's not good or bad, but it's a problem. Yeah. Well, so let, let me follow up on that because I, I think we do want to be sensitive to you know the stakeholders going to be impacted by this. The intent would not be to be required to disclose any conversation or discussion. Again, as normal, you're just essentially reporting the amount of money spent or expended, right? So that, that's no different. Uh, we've also asked that this bill not go in effect for one year to give us time to update the filing system with the idea that right now you toggle a button, say, I testified, say, on an environmental matter. That's all you time. We would try to replace it with essentially a check down box or drop down box of some of the different bills. So you're essentially checking the boxes. And yes, it's going to be more work to do that, right? If you're tracking or you're actively lobbying on, say, 30 bills, that's that's 30 bills you have to make sure you're, you're checkmarking, and, and that is more of an effort. But I think the intent from a public disclosure perspective to just say, hey, I spent you know, 20 hours in an environmental area isn't necessarily too descriptive from a public point of view. I think the intent to say, no, hey, here's the bills I was really working on is probably more sort of in fulfillment of what the policy is here. Okay, th thanks a lot, Robert. By the way, there are several questions that were directed to you in the Q&A box. If you could take a look at that, and maybe we can handle that as, as we close out. But I'd like to now uh, turn to the budget and fiscal issues, I think, which are very important. And uh, a lot of the audience probably would like to know what may happen. Uh, and I, I, again, I want to thank uh, Senator Keith Agaron and Representative Kitagawa because they're taking leave from their uh, uh, hearings right now to participate and tell you uh, what the budget and fiscal situation is. And so I'd like to start off with uh, Senator Agaron uh, about the budget concerns and what about the, uh, you know, the the money committee's view on inflation and uh, the estimate of future revenues. So I'll, I'll turn it to Senator Agora. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, as, as you know, the, the, the new governor has submitted a budget to the legislature, but that budget was really worked on by uh, the outgoing administration. And what that budget reflects really is, um, I guess you can call it a status quo budget for the most part. Uh, the major adjustments in that budget, if you look at uh, on budget and budget finances website, the budget in brief uh, has a has a good description of what what's in that budget right now. Uh, mainly some adjustments for fixed costs like Medicaid, uh, pensions, and benefits, and those kinds of things. And then, so, and then on the fringes of each department, um, so uh, some minor changes. Uh, I think a lot of the department's requests are things that were held out that are now being reviewed by the new administration, which, remember, has only been in office since December 3rd. So uh, this, this gives the new budget and finance director, as well as all the rest of the departments, a chance to review those requests and we would expect that after the governor's state of the state address um, on the Monday following opening day, that we'll be seeing exactly what, what it is that the governor really wants in the budget. Um, and it's, it's one of the challenges for both the Finance and the Ways and Means Committee, um, because we're, we're working on the budgets right now, um, even though uh, the Senate will get the budgets um, after the after finance sends us a house draft, uh, we all we already are working on our own draft, and we're also uh, reviewing uh, the projections that are being made by the council and revenues, which uh, met yesterday, and we'll be meeting again in March before we finish the Senate draft. The council and revenues yesterday um, made one adjustment, which was really to reduce the projection for this. Uh, for this year from 6.5% to 5.5. And that's really to reflect the fact that there was a major change in the general fund because of uh, the uh, 
the tax rebates that were given to most residents um, in the in the past year. Uh, but they also adjusted upward the projection for next fiscal year from four percent to five percent. So basically, it's a wash. the uh, The projections going out are are what was projected back in September. So we're looking at um, for this coming fiscal year about uh, 10.35, um, uh, $395 billion in um, general fund revenues. So in that sense, uh, the projections right now that we're all, I think both finance and WAM are working with um, are, this, are at status quo. Um, what, we're look, what the governor is proposing currently is an $18 billion budget in the first year and $17.86 billion in the second year. And which is about uh, an increase of about four percent in the first year and three percent in the second year. On the general fund side, uh, in the first year, uh, the governor's proposal is an increase of about six hundred sixty million dollars. Um, in the second year, four hundred seventy-two million. On the CIP portion of the budget, which is what I really concentrate on. Uh, the governor is proposing a $2.1 billion CIP budget in the first year and a $1.4 billion budget in the second year. The, the interesting thing about the proposal is that um, of the CIP projects, about $462 million is proposed for geo bonds in the first year and three hundred and fifty eight million in the second year. And... Uh, which is actually uh, sounds like a smaller number than usual, but they're also proposing $324 million of CIP with general funds in the first year and $295 million in the second year. Uh, we did fund a large portion of, of CIP in the last budget with general funds. So um, it'll be interesting to see um, uh, how that how that pans out to see uh, whether or not uh, the departments are able to get those projects out because uh, there is a little bit of a, a shorter period of time to spend that money um, that the general funds that were appropriated last year. The um, the other thing that I think the council on revenues as well as I think you hero and uh, the state economists are a little bit concerned about is, of course, they're watching uh, the expected recession on the mainland. Um, and they, right now, they'll expect that the recession will not be as hard on Hawaii, uh, mainly uh, because they see, they still see a lot of construction coming in, mainly um, funded by the federal government that will benefit Hawaii, as well as they expect that we will start to see a return of the Japanese visitors. Um, because currently, um, you know, our visitor industry is doing much better than expected. And that, was, and that has been without a major component of the industry, which is Japanese visitors. And so in that sense, um, they think that we will not be hurt by, well, I don't, I don't mean by not hurt, but um, the impact of the recession might be lessened in Hawaii. Um, that being said, I think uh, people should remember that part of the reason our numbers look so good is probably due to inflation. Um, the, inf the inflation on prices and inflation also means that probably a some of the collections are a little bit hard, uh, larger be based on the fact that we are um, in an inflationary state at the moment. Uh, as the president said at the outset of this, uh, one thing that people have been focused on is all the uh, talk about a $2 billion surplus currently. And I think the governor, I, um, I think we'll be looking closely at what the governor poses in his, um, in his changes and, and what, he's, what he um, identifies as his priorities in the state of the state. Uh, but as the, as the Senate president said, I, I think we're, we're going to be, we're a little bit more focused in the Senate on looking at um, one-time investments, uh, things that will, um, just because we're cautious about whether or not this kind of revenue can be sustained um, over the long hauls. So new programs will get a lot of scrutiny. Um, 
And so what we're looking at is probably looking at filling in holes and and looking at how best to um, you know follow through on the things that were proposed in, in recent budgets. Thank, thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Senator. Um, oh, I'm, I'm Bob, I just wanted to mention one thing, though. Sure. Um, uh, while we did not have a lot of new members, uh, most of the committees have been reconstituted. And so um, if you look at the, the, the morning committees, consumer protection, judiciary, and ways and means, um, there are some new members on each of those committees. Uh, so people that are uh, probably are not as familiar or haven't been working on, on those types of issues in the last couple of sessions. I would also note that um, Ways and Means has 13 members this year. So we fully have um, more than enough to reorganize the Senate if we wanted to, because uh, we have a majority. Good, thank you. Uh, that's a good segue. Uh, because when I asked uh, Representative Lisa Kitagawa to be on the panel, uh, I think most of you know that uh, Representative Yamashita, Kyle Yamashita from Maui, is the new House Finance Chair, and uh, Lisa Kitagawa is the Vice Chair. And I mentioned to Lisa that the House Finance has been um, chaired for so many years from now Lieutenant Governor Sylvia Luke, that whether we can expect any differences and as Senator Agaron said, that there are a lot of new members on House Finance. And uh, so I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Rep Kitagawa to, to mention uh, how any, will there be any changes in how they're gonna conduct hearings uh, what about the new members? I assume they had some uh, introductory uh, internal discussions. And so go ahead, Lisa. <clears throat> Thanks, Bob. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for the question. So um, yes, Chair Yamashita and I are both new to the committee. Um, but you know, the role of the Finance Committee and its jurisdictions are spelled out in our House rules. So we're really not expecting any drastic changes to the way finance is run. Um, you know, our processes and our hearings will always be in line with the Constitution and the whole E-Revised statutes, as well as our House rules. So it's unlikely that much will change. Um, our leadership is still working on our House rules right now, so we'll know a little bit more and it'll get adopted by resolution on opening day. But, you know, I encourage everyone, as we've all mentioned throughout this panel, that you know, we really want people to participate in the legislative process and to submit your testimony and to come in person or on Zoom. And we just really want to make sure that um, your voice is heard. So the Finance Committee will continue to welcome um, your testimony and your input throughout the legislative process. And as we've um, talked about, you know, a lot, we have a lot of new members in the House. So there will be a total of 18 new members. Um, on finance, there are 16 members, 10 of those members will be first year freshmen. Um, and so we have begun some training and information and we're actually going through informational briefings right now where departments are coming in and sharing information about their organizations as well as their budget requests. And so there will definitely be a steep learning curve um, for many of us on finance. Um, but, you know, I think this is a really great opportunity for everyone to just learn a lot about state government and just where the concerns are, where the strengths are, and where areas might be that we need to focus on um, during this legislative session. You know, Lisa, I, I assume that, you know, everything is is new. And uh, what Senator Agaron said that I assume the House Finance initially, you know, is looking at the same issues that the Senate is the ways and means is on the budget and inflation and uh, future revenues. I, I assume that you and Kyle and others have had discussion about that as well. Yes, yeah. And I think we've, um, you know, everyone else earlier has really kind of highlighted some of the areas that we're going to be looking at and working on, whether it's housing or homelessness or um, Della mentioned um, mental health issues. And so these are areas that we're going to be working with the Senate on for sure and continuing to work with our colleagues on because these are really issues that are pressing in the community and things that we have heard from a lot of community members as things that need to be addressed, hopefully, this legislative session. 
You know, there's a question, I'll just answer that, uh, about whether budget and finance uh, and, and uh, important to understand the relationship between the Council of Revenues, Finance Committee and Ways and Means. Can there be a webinar for the public to help the public understand at a layman's level? Uh, that's, an, that's a very interesting question. Uh, that's something that that could be discussed with think tech and uh, maybe in the future. Uh, uh, even though I've been lobbying for many years, the first time I had to deal with appropriation for a client that had to deal with ways and means and finance, I had to learn how the budget process worked, et cetera. And I know that uh, to many people, uh, including lobbyists, it's a mystery. You know, so that's a good question. Maybe maybe a little bit of a history to answer that question. Uh, the reason we have a council on revenues really is because um, in the bad old days, um, everyone had their own projections on what state revenues would be like. So the governor had his had a projection. Ways and Means had their own projection. Finance had their own projection. Tax department had their own projections. And people in the community had their own projections. So the idea was to have one body that would um, have a common projection that the governor, as well as the two money committees, would all have to rely on and and, and um, base their budgets on. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, it's not a static committee. I mean, they they meet quarterly, and so the projections can go up and down. Um, you know, they had met in September and they met yesterday. And they, they did react to some adjustments that the tax department uh, brought to their attention. So the reason we um, have the council on revenue is to make sure that, you know, you don't have ways and means saying, well, we don't think it'll be 10.4 million. We really think it's going to be 12 million. So we're going to appropriate a budget that uh, of, you know, 11 million when, when we'll still have a surplus of a million of, or a billion. And, and that's one of the main functions of what, of, why we have a council of revenues is to um, have a common place to talk about how much revenue we can um, actually work with. Oh, th- thanks, Senator. You know, I had a question when you were mentioning CIP, which is capital improvement projects. Uh, do you think that the money committees or the legislature, I shouldn't say the money committees, will be focusing on repair and maintenance of state buildings and schools at all? Or has this gone? Uh, we need to. And uh, one, of the, one of the limits that we've had in the past is really when we were so dependent on general obligation bonds, um, that, that is limited in what you can, and on the types of projects you can spend your bonds on because uh, technically you really want the improvement to be a little bit aligned with the with the time uh, to repay the, the bonds, the debt service. So I think um, with with cash CIP, I think we have a little bit of more leeway. I'm um, assuming you can meet the time deadlines to get the project out um, to do the things that need to be done. If you need to replace um, furniture, if you need to replace carpet, things that don't have a life of a 20 or 30 year. Uh, jail bond. And um, I think one of the things we've seen at the, all the schools is um, is there was no follow-up on funding in part um, because it didn't align with the length of time you need for, for a jail bond project. But um, obviously, those are, the, those are the bulk of the requests that we're going to get from um, the university and DOE as well as the um, DAGs on, on R&M projects. Good. Th- thank you, Senator. Uh, we, we have a little less than five minutes left. Uh, there are a lot of questions, and uh, I think it's not possible to answer all the questions, but uh, ThinkTech keeps a list of all the questions. I get them, and uh, we will try to answer as many of them as possible after we um, uh, and and put out uh, a memo of some sort to to answer some of the questions. 
uh, for, for the audience, uh, uh, as the public at large, you know, one of the reasons that I wanted to have uh, the Commission to Improve Standards of Conduct and uh, Robert Harris on is that they are going to submit uh, legislation. And, you know, because of all the media coverage of uh, the concerns with corruption, et cetera, I thought it was important for uh, the public to understand what the Commission did and, and, and some of the recommendations. So, do any of the legislators uh, have any kind of final comments? And then I will close out the, the session. Yeah, Bob, I just wanted to make one clarification of what Carl mentioned on, on the process. Um, even though uh, hearings for a second committee in the Senate are usually decision making, that doesn't mean that we make the decision in a vacuum. Usually the, the committees will be reviewing the testimony that was submitted both in the subject matter committee and any written testimony that's being submitted in judiciary, consumer protection, and ways and means. And it, I think uh, our staff takes a very close look at the testimony. And uh, that's why you still see a lot of amendments um, during decision making. And it's all usually based on the written testimony. And um, I, again, I think you had, a, and if you can't um, get the written testimony and you still you know, have the usual um, options of contacting members of the committee to let them know what your concern is. And sometimes that gets um, worked into decisions as well. Yeah, just to summarize, historically uh, in the Senate, uh, after the substantive committee has heard a bill, and it gets referred to Ways and Means, they basically don't have a full-blown hearing, but have decision-making. But that, as Senator Algaran said, that doesn't mean they just say, oh, well, we're just gonna do, uh, pass it out or kill it. They look at the, the money implications in that particular bill and make certain decisions. And uh, in, the, in the House, traditionally, the Finance Committee, when uh, representatives now, Lieutenant Governor Luke was running the committee, and even before that, they had full-blown hearings, uh, even though the substantive committee has had uh, hearings uh, before that, but they focused also on the uh, fiscal and, and, the, and the money issues. Um, <clears throat> okay, we're at the end. It's almost 10.30. Uh, I'd like to thank all of those that have uh, logged on to this webinar. And uh, we're going to uh, upload a evaluation. And if you could fill that out, it would be very helpful to me and to Pacific Law Institute, as well as the legislators who have participated. And uh, we're thinking about doing a follow-up in March uh, to see what bills are still alive and, and have a panel discussion on those to give you an idea of what potentially could pass uh, in May. Uh, so please fill that out. Uh, I'd like to thank Jay Fidel and the staff at ThinkTech, and of course, all of the uh, legislators, uh, uh, Senate Presidents, uh, House Speaker Psyche, uh, Senator Carl Rhodes, and Senator uh, Gil Keith Agaran, and Representative uh, uh, Delal Bolotti, and Representative Lisa Kitagawa, and of course, Robert Harris for uh, participating and taking the time and thank you all for participating. I hope it has been helpful.